Beauty. Takashi. I've been waiting for you. This might be an unpopular opinion, but I actually enjoyed the dark method. Yes, I know there are issues. And I mean issues. Like blow your brains out kind of issues. But I can't help be grounded in the atmosphere of the movie. Or should I say both movies, since when I bought it on VHS, it came with two tapes. Both being well over 40 minutes long, which does add to its bloated runtime. But we'll get into that later. So the movie begins with our main character, if you can even call him that. We barely spend any time with him in both the movies. I could barely even remember his name, but luckily I wrote it down. His name is Takashi, if I'm saying that right. But I'd rather call him by his real name, Shinji, because that's basically who he is in this movie. And for those who don't know who Shinji is, he's of Evangelion fame. And to be honest, him and Shinji do have a lot of similarities. Right down from his look to his ending choice in the final movie. So we continue to watch Shinji, and he's walking around in a museum that is implied that he frequents often. See him take fancy to an artifact with some snake figures on it. As he takes a closer look, old man Lester the Molester hits him with a history lesson. Right in the first five minutes, we're hit with one of the most glaring problems of this entire movie. The movie's favorite pastime of having one of the characters pull down their pants and diarrhea all over the screen with your exposition. It seems to be some sort of sexual fetish with this old man especially. I don't understand what's going on here. What was it that Master Kukuchiko wanted so badly from Takashi? And why did everyone have to die? And what's all this stuff about the Atman? And where's Takashi gone? Very well, I'll explain it all to you. In ferocity, Ardra craves blood. Consider Takashi's holy fights disaster. The one on his lies within these words that in Wushu's Most of the time, I personally don't care about things like that, but in this movie, it makes you literally want to go to sleep. In fact, when I was watching the second part, I did fall asleep and had to rewatch it. And I would say the second one is actually the better half of the movie. Though this beginning scene is not the worst of the exposition dumps. So after the old man spews his guts out, he actually just disappears. So Shinji goes home, unsettled after his recent groping by old man liver spots over here. And here's where we get a good look at Shinji's mom. She doesn't really play a big part in the movie, but is worth mentioning. Besides being a bad parent, um, she doesn't really do anything much. She gets killed, I guess, and that's about it. We find out Shinji's being followed, and the next day, when he's going to school, he is confronted by the man. Turns out, the guy he's following him is some sort of detective, I guess. Because I can't really remember if they tell you or not who he is. Him and Shinji talk, and they cut right away to investigating Shinji's dad's murder, which we are shown glimpses of in the beginning of the movie of Shinji crying over his dad's body. They conclude from Shinji's dad's journal entries that he was looking for a treasure. As they retrace the steps of Shinji's father's murder, old man Meatloaf walks up the hill with his brittle bones cracking and aching every step, mad that Shinji's hanging out with other strange old men. And in an act to regain Shinji's love, he shows them the way to the secret cave, which is thought to have treasure in it. All three of them go to explore the cave, walking over the dead corpses of the old man's previous lovers. As they look around, the detective gets spooked by this armless serpent. From what I could tell, it's like some samurai guy that was turned into a snake to guard the tunnel. It was mentioned in some really long exposition. It might as well not been mentioned at all because they never go back to this cave after this. While they're in there, Old Man picks up a statue. He then does his favorite thing and talks some more about this statue. This time, it's actually something that matters, because as Shinji and the others drive back to wherever, the entity portrayed on the statue then teleports the car to a different dimension, and Shinji is then kind of teleported out of the car, and the car crashes. 
killing the detective guy, but not killing the old man, which really sucks. This leaving Shinji in some weird dimension where he gets told about some prophecy or something like that. Please forgive me for not knowing every single name of everything that's mentioned because so much shit is mentioned and I can barely remember any of it. So this then teleports Shinji to like a rock or something. We're then introduced to a new character. He's some heir to the f one of the first clans in Japan or something and he has taken an interest in the prophecy. And because he's somewhat important, he magically find Shinji laying on a rock in the middle of nowhere. Shinji being unconscious, they take him away. And there's this monk guy there not saying anything about it, as three strange men take away a boy in their car. So this guy takes him to this other shrine, I guess, and they talk about how he's the prophesized one and he needs to get all eight birthmarks or something. Shinji being retarded just lets things happen to him and never asks any questions. Sprinkled in between all of this is many lectures of Japanese history. I also forgot to mention the hobgoblins ready to devour Shinji while he's sleeping. And it's parts like this that really catch my interest. I just wish there was more of that instead of this. I see, sir. You're on a pilgrimage from the temple at Mount Haye. Yes, I'm on my way to 400 the years old, and in that time, he was able to achieve enlightenment. At the time, his job was to learn the words of the gods through the shrine meditation. I was on my way to the temple. He was a sort of genie, considered Shakyamuni's holy monk. To that, one on his forehead. I am not unworthy. I should like to become a medium. Moving on, we are introduced to a new character. He's also some clan leader of some Japanese family. So both these clan leaders um, go investigate further. And what do you know, they find the Fountain of Youth. And just before they investigate further, the random guy has to go check up on Shinji because he disappeared, I guess. So this gives the random girl the perfect opportunity to do a little skinny dipping. But as she exits the water, she deforms into one of the hunchback ghoulies. I won't let Kikuchiko play all high and mighty as the head of the clan now. I'm gonna have the inheritance of Yamata for myself. The random guy returns also with the old man once again for him to deliver some more exposition. Then the old man turns around and says you've heard too much exposition, then tells him not to involve himself any further. Then we see Shinji walking off into the darkness with all his new friends. And that's where part one of this movie ends. So far an interesting premise at least. On top of that, the movie so far has some pretty good visuals. And I've always been kind of a sucker for these old school animes. Yes, I know, all the characters are uninteresting and boring, and it really does not follow any of, like, writing standards at all. But maybe they'll make up for that in the second part. They don't. So the second part opens with exposition, more shit about prophecies and whatnot, and then we see everyone's on the hunt for Shinji. More nameless characters doing more unknown actions. One of the henchmen of the clan, who seems to have more significance than the rest, is out looking for Shinji, but then stumbles upon old man Lester. So he follows him, finding out something. They don't even take time to explain it at all. So I guess this horse is the evil god, while the clan worships a silver horse that's not the evil god and then i guess someone spots shinji somewhere in like a park or something and then that guy gets murdered by a bunch of hunchback ghouls but then another guy spots shinji driving on the road somewhere and then they all go to get him i guess so shinji's talking to another stranger again taking him to god only knows and i forgot to mention i guess this entire time shinji was in some sort of trance by the evil horse, I think? It's very unclear. They then hit a roadblock and it's the Ku Klux Klan. They knock out the driver for some reason and hold Shinji at gunpoint for some reason too. I guess the leader of the Ku Klux Klan really wanted the other half of this ring that Shinji has and Shinji complies, not having any other questions opposing it. I guess this ring is supposed to make you the leader of Japan. It's never really brought up ever again so it doesn't really matter. The ring summons the evil horse. And this is where the fun begins. The crate on the truck that Shinji was in erupts with all the zombie creatures and then the bloodbath begins.
wiping out the entire clan. Battle leaves the leader and some other guy that was talking to the leader earlier crawling away from the monsters. But the monsters then lose focus and crawl to this weird Buddha statue instead. But it was a trap by the weird monk guy that was shown earlier. Shinji is then teleported I guess in a random part of the woods where the old guy finds him and takes him to a beach. In this shrine on the beach, there's these rocks that look like eggs, and the old guy talks about them. He talks about how people in the past used these eggs to give themselves eternal life. He then proceeds to crack them all open. Everyone that used these eggs are dead, except one. Genji cracks the last one open, and it has a princess in it. Princess confuses Shinji with a much more interesting character, then falls apart, struggling to give Shinji this magic mirror. Of course, they don't bother to explain what the mirror does, and that random clan members also following him too, giving us some very insightful comments. The shrine gets struck by lightning and a bunch of shit happens. Shinji proceeds to cry like a baby and go home, only to find his mother at knife point. She dies. Shinji then gets his eighth dimple, and then another MacGuffin. I can only assume helps him with his faith stat. Back to the leader guy, we actually find out he's the brother of Shinji's mom. And we find out that he's the one that killed Shinji's father. But not for the treasure, because he's a big crybaby just like Shinji. Turns out he wanted to be the chosen one or whatever. And the weirdest thing is, Shinji finds this all out from the guy that survived the battle with the leader guy. For some reason, he's holding Shinji's mom at knife points. So with all this new information, Shinji finally makes a character choice. He goes full samurai and kills the leader guy, but only after calling down the dark horse spirit to help him. But I don't know how. So after all this, Shinji achieves enlightenment, just to have a chat with the universe. So they talk, and Shinji is presented with the choice to either become a god or stay a loser. But if he stays a loser, he might bring the evil force with him. While this is happening, the old man goes back to his cave and gets inside his egg. It should never be seen again. Where then shown Shinji chose to stay with the looming threat of the evil horse, with the ending seeming very pointless at the end. Did everything we just watched mean nothing? And I know what you're saying. I thought you said you liked this movie. I do. And I do think it's perfect in its own sense. This movie really reminds me of like Twin Peaks and Lord of the Rings. It's a really weird combination where it leaves you with more questions than answers. I'm also really in love with the concept and I love the box art. Yeah, sure, it could have been better, but it's always interesting to see someone's vision come to life. Let me know if you guys want to hear more about this in the future or maybe a different movie because I have tons of movies. And I mean more specifically anime movies from ADV or manga video, because I have a bunch of obscure movies from the early 2000s like that. So, see ya.